Josh, and uh, thanks first for uh, allowing me to come and uh, provide uh, this information to uh, its attendees at, at this workshop. Uh, so this workshop is on building a successful abuse desk. Uh, the training will focus on what the team's role will be, uh, what you look for in team members, how incidents are generated and processed, and finally, what the results of the abuse desk should look like. Uh, from there, we'll discuss the human factor of your team, uh, what to look for in team members, and overall, just uh, the results that you should look for. Uh, my name is Severin Walker. Uh, I am the Messaging Malware and Mobile Anti-Abuse Working Groups Board Co-Chair. Uh, so first off, let's get into what MOG is specifically. Advanced slide, there we go. So a real short introduction to MOG for those who aren't familiar with uh, um, our organization. Uh, like FIRST, we are a global organization. Um, and so uh, if for whatever reason I uh, cover a slide too quickly or there's a term that I use that uh, you know isn't universally understood, feel free to also use the Q&A box uh, to ask for clarification. Uh, we'll take a couple of points to stop and uh, cover some of the Q&A questions as well throughout the discussion, and there will be time at the end to cover that. So MOG was founded in 2004, uh, and it's where the industry comes together to work against botnets, malware, spam, viruses, denial of service attacks, and other online uh, exploitation. Like I mentioned, we are a global organization uh, with 260 member companies uh, worldwide. We hold three meetings a year, and typically uh, those meetings have 300 to 400 com conference participants. Uh, we've had similar numbers for our virtual meetings in the past year as well. So what does MOG do? Uh, we develop and publish best practice papers. Uh, we also comment on position statements if there's uh, regulations or um, calls for comment uh, from different uh, governing bodies or uh, organizations like ICANN. Uh, we produce training and educational videos and work with our partners uh, to do the same, uh, much like today's workshop. Uh, we're not a lobbying group. Uh, we just uh, speak as a, a nonprofit voice for the industry. So first, uh, let's start with the term abuse desk itself. Uh, we'll get into the workshop here. So abuse desk is not necessarily the common term used in every organization or every region of the world. Um, some companies may call it the compliance department uh, because of its responsibility to ensure regulatory or policy compliance. Uh, some organizations may opt to use the incident response. Uh, we know first, uh, you know, that's part of the name here, for example. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, for organizations who interact directly with consumers, um, they may be wary of the word abuse itself and believe it's not a positive word to use uh, with their customers. Uh, it's important to note that the nature of an incident response team is generally understood to be different than an IT security context. Um, it, than an abuse desk. So abuse desk may be more customer facing, may be more regulatory or compliance, whereas your IT security team may be looking at the edge uh, firewalls and uh, attacks against the network infrastructure. One thing I'd like to hear from the audience today is other variations that you've heard on this term uh, and perhaps what you call it in your own organization. For the sake of the training, uh, we'll continue to refer to the operation as the abuse desk though. Uh, when creating a team, if you don't already have one or you're forming it currently, of course, you're free to consider a department name that's appropriate to the work that you perform, uh, who you interact with and what the cultural norm is. So let's review the sections of training uh, included in the workshop today. Uh, first, we'll cover the purpose of the department and how this is a justifiable investment for any service provider to engage in. Uh, that'll bring us to the abuse desk incidents themselves. Uh, these are the items that the department must work through. Uh, we discuss the complete typical life cycle of an incident involving one of your customers uh, with suggestions on where efficiencies and automation can play a role. Next, we'll review the composition of the abuse desk team, uh, how you maintain employee skills and well-being in light of some of the stress that they may endure as part of the role. 
And finally, we'll look at the potential results and the output of an abuse desk, uh, tying it back to the business justification. That'll be your opportunity to reflect the return on investment made by your business or organization. So the purpose of the abuse desk. Most segments of the communications industry have a responsibility for some sort of anti-abuse. Um, you, you're responsible to you know, protect the internet from your customers and protect your customers from threats on the internet. Uh, as providers, uh, we have the responsibility to build a safer web experience uh, for our customers. As the industry matures, other providers such as social media and video game services even have also had to consider how they respond to policy and security incidents involving their users. So if we look at a phishing attack and how that can impact many segments of the industry, uh, we start with security vendor uh, in this case, as they can typically have a holistic view of an attack from multiple customer sources. Uh, this type of investigation and reporting follow-up uh, could come from any of the sectors though. So the team that detected the phishing will likely send incident reports to the email and mailbox service providers where the phishing email originated from. They may also send an incident response to the hosting service provider where the fake websites linked to in the email were being hosted. Finally, because of botnets and other malware infections uh, that can occur within co consumer detections, they will also have the need to notify ISPs of their customers' involvement in the attacks. That's just one example of collaboration across the industry between abuse desks, uh, but with proper insight into your customer incidents, critical incident information and feedback can help empower everyone's policy decisions. So if we talk about the business justification of an abuse desk, uh, we all understand that proper processing of incident reports when it comes to your organization's policies is important. It may be difficult though to justify that need to those in your organization that are making business and financial decisions. In the following section, uh, we'll discuss how to quantify the importance of an abuse desk and how it can make financial sense to support one as well. So your brand is what identifies your organization as being distinct from other organizations. A trusted brand ensures customers and industry partners have confidence in your company and its services. So aside from the concept of reputation, a successful brand can reap the rewards of increased adoption, efficiencies gained when working with other industry members, retention of satisfied customers, and employee retention gains. So by being a successful abuse desk department, uh, you can definitely have a, a variety of benefits um, you know, that are listed out here on this slide. Uh, so a security incident response team is typically justified because it can help protect from loss, uh, from the misuse of equipment or a loss of data. Meanwhile, an abuse desk plays a similar role, uh, but also protects the company from fines resulting in a lack of regulatory compliance or refund losses from customers having a poor experience. Legal investigations require precious time and money, of course, uh, and abuse desk must understand and adhere to regulations in order to avoid uh, costly fines. So for example, uh, in the United States, uh, there's been internet service providers who have seen fines of over $25 million from the courts for not acting on copyright infringement notifications. Uh, so that's a regulatory um, uh, requirement of an ISP uh, that passed legislation over 20 years ago um, and has a monetary value attached to it that an abuse desk can protect uh, the ISP from by being a successful abuse desk. Every region has their own laws uh, that may govern your organization, of course. Uh, it's important to consult your legal and government affairs staff on a regular basis to ensure your operation is prepared for incidents relevant to the regional requirements. Uh, for example, um, you know, Canada has anti-spam laws. The Japanese government has a number of regulations uh, that the abuse desk can play a part in um, making sure they are compliant. Uh, within the United States, again, uh, we have a number of states now with privacy laws similar to the GDPR, 
in Europe. Uh, and so if you operate within those states, um, you know, your abuse desk has to be responsible for responding to those regulatory incidents. So it's not just true for consumer ISPs, but also hosting providers as well. Uh, they are, are subject to some of the content or copyright infringement responsibilities seen uh, in the United States and uh, in other regions of the world. Uh, so when considering the charter of your abuse desk team and how it enforces compliance, you have to consider what services are provided on the equipment your company owns and operates. So building a robust abuse operation uh, that acts upon the threats before they have an impact on your network results in a faster, more reliable experience for your customers as well. Uh, most companies would rather be known for the integrity of their network instead of instability and poor IP reputation of their mail servers, for example. Uh, continued abuse mitigation ensures that the quality of your network becomes a marketable selling point to new and existing customers. Uh, for services offering shared resources, such, such as an email sending platform or a social media platform, outbound IPs or a cloud service uh, virtual system, uh, the impact of unmitigated abuse to other customers can be readily apparent. So by not uh, responding to incidents on one customer, that IP reputation uh, may affect several other customers who share the outbound traffic with it. Maintaining a secure internet experience is a daunting task for most consumers, and companies that take security incidents seriously earn their customers' trust. Uh, if we attempt to educate and empower our customers, they will become more knowledgeable and less susceptible to threats. Uh, this will minimize their need for continuous support. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, that's the end of the business justification uh, information, uh, and now we'll get into incident processing. Um, but just a reminder, if you do have any questions uh, or yeah, I covered something, you know, maybe too quickly or um, it wasn't clear enough, uh, feel free to use the Q&A box uh, here in the Zoom user interface. All right, so let's talk about the incidents that the abuse does candles. So if we consider incidents as phases of an overall cycle, uh, the five stages comprise the incidents from their generation through resolution and hopefully some insight gained into your operation by the end of the cycle uh, before detection begins again. So the first step of detection is identifying the source of your abuse data. Uh, the majority of these will likely come from third party sources and data feeds. Uh, but can also come from your own operations and platform monitoring tools. Uh, so uh, as we see here, some of your security monitoring may uh, generate um, incidents. Uh, customers may report incidents to you. Uh, and then of course, there's third party sources. Uh, many of them are uh, Intel and data feed sources that are first members, for example, um, where you can subscribe and gain incident data from them uh, for your department to act on. And we did receive a question about the recording being made available for review later. Uh, it, it will be, so if, if there's a part that you missed or you want to uh, review, uh, that will be available to you. Thank you. So uh, looking at example incidents uh, through the detection phase, uh, an abuse desk must be able to take public information such as an IP address or domain and refer it to a specific subscriber or device that they are responsible for. This will come with a variety of corresponding evidence concerning the violation or attempted attack from the source. So as we see here, um, again, copyright infringement notifications, firewall alarms, or, or denial of service attacks. Uh, you know, these are all example incidents that an abuse desk may handle. There we go. So during the reporting phase, uh, important metadata is extracted and compiled into a machine readable format. Uh, this data can be acted upon or sent to the abuse desk responsible to the source. So, uh, you know, the data that really is required for most incidents should include the incident timestamp and with the time zone. Uh, and we'll get into why that's important shortly. 
Um, the source, so mailbox, IP and domain, incident details, um, so the firewall logs, the, the copyrighted content information. Um, so many of you have probably seen a firewall incident um, or, or have had to uh, uh, respond to one. Uh, so they typically uh, contain the IP source. So where did the attack come from? Uh, the attempted network activity. So uh, what destination port did they attempt access on? Uh, what type of, uh, you know, uh, packet, how many packets were sent, et cetera. Um, and the timestamp from the event log. Uh, meanwhile, phishing messages contain similar information, uh, but you know, uh, because phishing is a different type of attack, it may also include uh, URLs uh, for IP hosts and involved domains. Um, and so we'll get into how this feeds into um, you know, potential automation uh, shortly. There is some reporting etiquette to uh, consider. Um, so uh, in order to facilitate collaborative relationships when reporting incidents to other abuse uh, operations, you can't assume that you're a trusted reporter that will get results on a single complaint right away. Uh, con contact information for security incidents can often be found on a website support or about page. Uh, additionally, if the domain ownership is unclear, uh, it may be valuable to start by contacting the hosting provider for the IP it resolves to. Uh, this can typically be found in the IP registry uh, relevant to the region, of course. Uh, when considering sensitive data about your customers and how much should be redacted, uh, you need to contact your organization's policy regarding distribution and retention of the various values, along with consideration of where the report is and could go to. Um, so things like uh, account numbers, PII, et cetera, um, you know, you will need to work with your legal department to clear, you know, what's being reported, what's made available. Um, customer status. Um, in, in a lot of areas, you can't even report that, you know, you've identified the customer, let alone that you may have turned their service off. And so these are things that you'll want to um, clear with uh, both the, the policies and, uh, you know, legal department within your org. So uh, one way to uh, efficiently report uh, phishing incidents in particular, um, the APWG provides a method uh, to, per to report phishing messages or, or just the URLs themselves. Um, forwarding the phishing email as an attachment allows them to inspect the header details and other information. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can use the web form on the APWG's reporting page or plan with APWG to submit URLs in bulk. Um, you know, they're very easy to work with and, and you know, they want to get the data and, and process it um, to ensure that incidents are responded to. Uh, so they will work with you on that. Uh, from there, they collate all the phishing URLs uh, they receive and make a feed of the data available to its members who will typically ingest the data for incident response. Uh, so this is another feed for, you know, an ISP or a hosting provider to potentially um, detect new incidents, to bring new incidents in, into the uh, abuse desk. Uh, so that could include taking down a malicious URL or removing a shortened URL redirection. So uh, let's discuss how an operation can take in incidents to remediate abuse that their network or platform is responsible for. In many operations, the abuse desk staff will manually process reports directly from the inbox they were sent to, uh, importing the information and enriching it with a variety of tools for the next phases of the incident lifecycle. Uh, so this you know, may look fairly familiar uh, to a number of you who are currently uh, working incidents or had worked incidents for your organization in the past. Uh, fairly simple view of it. The tools used by the abuse desk will determine uh, its ability to effectively enforce the policies of the organization. So you're only as good as the tools and resources made available to your abuse desk, essentially. A mail client review incidents as they are reported should allow for searching for specific content strings or reporters, uh, allowing for multiple users to engage without conflicting with each other's work, uh, meaning that you, know, you don't want multiple analysts uh, retrieving the same email and both of them working on it, you know, causing a, a redundancy in, in the work being done. Uh, enforcing organization security policies uh, means uh, ensuring that only the proper employee roles have access. Uh, there should not be an open mailbox, um, you know, and if 
there are more sensitive uh, categories of reports, um, enforcing access roles to those reports specifically. And uh, retaining email in accordance with organizational policy. So some content may need to be kept indefinitely for legal compliance purposes, for example. Uh, even if there is no legislative mandate, uh, the organization may opt to keep reports forever in some cases uh, in the event that they are needed for uh, court evidence purposes. So subscriber identification, uh, let's discuss what we mean by that. <coughs> Excuse me. So upon receipt of an incident response, uh, the responsible end user device is determined by evaluating the report metadata or content provided. So in this case, an ISP has received a complaint about one of their subscriber IP addresses being the source of a spam email. So we have the source IP and the timestamp of the incident. So why the timestamp is important is uh, many ISPs utilize dynamic IP assignments. Um, and so the data has to be used and the timestamp used to identify the specific account holder of the IP address at the time that the email was sent. This is why simply forwarding an email and having your customers forward, uh, not as an attachment, uh, but a simple forward uh, is not effective. You, you cannot identify the customer based off that without the email headers. Uh, for some platforms, the IP address may be shared by multiple clients. Uh, so while the timestamp may lend itself to identifying a unique user, other data may be necessary to review as well. Uh, values like the domain the email was sent from, uh, a unique message ID, or some sort of messaging campaign identifier should be reviewed to provide an irrefutable, irrefutable link to a customer's account. Uh, an easy interface for the abuse desk staff to query this information must then be made available. So when you're thinking about automation, um, thinking, think about extracting these fields uh, for your analysts, um, you know, in, in a quick and easy fashion, uh, instead of them scanning, you know, uh, multiple headers a day, uh, although they may just have to do that um, temporarily as well. So the same concept applies to most any valid incident report. Uh, as mentioned before, an abuse desk must be able to take public information, uh, such as an IP address or domain, and link it to a specific subscriber or device that they are responsible for. So again, these same thing holds true for firewall logs. Uh, the information should have consistent fields that they can use within their own internal uh, networking identification. So as an incident is processed by the abuse desk, tracking the information gathered during the investigation and the subsequent responsive actions taken is necessary. Uh, this requires a tool that at the very least provides fields for the abuse desk agents to input and store in a database system. Uh, beyond that basic concept, the tool could also provide automation and data enrichment functionality needed to process the incident. There are several commercial and even open source options available for these. Uh, before deciding on one, the operation must consider important factors about current and future demands. So having uh, the history available uh, to your analysts, uh, to your efficiencies uh, analysts, uh, is definitely uh, a critical must have for any abuse desk. So what should you track? Uh, as your operation scales, uh, the need of what needs to be tracked uh, should be based on a variety of data points, um, all of which become more useful over time. Uh, as we discuss in a later section, analysis can be an effective tool for adjusting policies and even reshaping the abuse desk model itself. So tracking your incidents may seem inconsequential at first. Uh, you know, many departments may think, well, we, we processed it, we, we took care of the customer, um, you know, now we can move on to the next without, you know, storing this information. Uh, there are a multitude of benefits that come from documenting the work you've done uh, listed here, though. So the rest of the tools used as examples here become more relevant in the later incident phases, as we'll now discuss. So your account management system, things like client notification tools, or even internal policy reference materials are all uh, critical components of an abuse desk. 
So there are three cri key criteria to keep in mind when defining enforcement guidelines. Uh, these are examples of incident enforcement actions from an ISP perspective uh, to demonstrate that not all issues require the same response or resources applied. That's why for every incident that comes in, you're not going to have the same automated response. Um, you'll need some way of determining uh, what type of incidents, uh, how many times you've engaged with the customer responsible, and uh, an enforcement uh, orchestration engine of some sort, some way of determining um, what your company's policy is based off the other two uh, criteria. In this example, uh, the offending party was found to be hosting a phishing site that contained a malware uh, executable. The ISP sent an email notification for the first occurrence. And then for the second occurrence, the account was temporarily shut off due to the repeat offenses. This is this uh, example ISP's policy. Your policies may be different um, and what you can do with the customer may even be different depending on local regulation. Uh, for that example, though, the offending party did not take heed to previous warnings, and as a result, the account was terminated on the third offense. In another example, an ISP detected a phishing message from a mailbox owner. Uh, it was their first offense, therefore they sent a notification alerting them to a, po a possible account compromise. But because the mailbox owner has either not resecured the account or has become compromised again, uh, the ISP had to suspend their credentials, forcing uh, engagement with technical support uh, to secure the account. The ISP spoke with the mailbox owner and they claim to have updated their password, uh, but a third offense occurs and the ISP has to temporarily shut off the customer services yet again. Finally, uh, in this example, an ISP received a court order from law enforcement advising that illegal activity had occurred at a customer's residence utilizing the service. Uh, the account will be terminated due to a violation of the terms of service in the first occurrence. Once you've defined a prescribed course of action for each incident type, you should consider setting up response times as well. Uh, the faster an incident is mitigated, the less risk it poses to the network. Uh, defined response times also allow you to measure the success of your abuse team and determine if you are staffed appropriately or um, are processing incidents uh, efficiently. Um, so these uh, breaking these down systematically uh, for the enforcement uh, part of the life cycle also aids in being able to create uh, an automation engine and simplifies the, the requirements for that automation engine. So although often overlooked, uh, defining what we say and how we say it is a critical component when designing a remediation policy. Uh, we should provide our clients with information regarding the incident and set clear expectations on next steps and what future violations could mean. Many times uh, account compromise or computer infections are done uh, because the customer uh, was not as educated on uh, computer security as they should have been. So taking a, a more educational approach, uh, keeping in mind the customer experience uh, could empower the customer to not be, become a repeat offender uh, or uh, also helps just spread that information. Maybe they help secure someone else's account and prevents them from being uh, yet another incident. So uh, companies should seek to retain the customer while preventing future incidents uh, through education, like I said. Uh, the communication channel you use is also dependent on the type of operation. So different mediums yield more effective results. Uh, we'll cover some things to consider as you choose what approach to take when remediating an incident with the customer. Uh, this information is taken from a concise operator handbook, best practices to address online mobile and telephony threats authored by a collaboration from several MOG and London Action Plan members. Uh, the handbook's primarily focused on ISPs, uh, internet service providers, but many of the concerns should be relevant to most service or platform providers. Uh, it's recommended that your organization review the entirety of that best practices document. Uh, these slides will be available to you, so you'll be able to get the link that's listed here. Um, but you know, review that as a supplement to this training as well. So per the handbook, uh, regarding your communication attempt, 
Uh, quote, the ISP may notify the user by email. Unfortunately, many times users never check the email that the ISP provides for their use, and the user may never provide the ISP with the email address that they do routinely use. Users may also have become wary of trusting email notifications as a result of widespread phishing attacks and tech support scams that mislead consumers about the presence of malware on their PCs. Uh, so, you know, for example, uh, if you're a Comcast internet subscriber, you may use a Gmail account that you've had, um, you know, for a number of years rather than use the Comcast.net account um, that was provided to you for free from the company. Um, and so you'll never see the email notification. And if you never told the ISP that, you know, you use your Gmail account, they don't know the proper account to reach out to you on it and let you know that a security incident occurred, uh, which means it does not get addressed and we'll see reoccurrence. Uh, when contacting customers, this is again from that handbook, uh, when contacting customers, it's important to consider that while automated calling can be efficient, users may be suspicious of phone-based notifications as a result of voice-based phishing attacks. On the other hand, live phone notification can be tedious and time-consuming if a large number of infected users need to be notified. So with email and telephone outreach, um, in both cases, you have to build that trust with your customer. You have to authenticate yourself as the service provider, much in the same way that you expect them to authenticate themselves as a user using your services. Um, so how you do that outreach, how you present yourself, how you present your email domain, that all has to be taken into consideration uh, for many of these uh, communication mediums. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, um, you have to keep in mind the scale um, uh, of the outreach. So if a telephone call takes on average 10 to 15 minutes, um, do you want to contact everyone who is responsible for a minor infraction uh, for their first offense? Or maybe send them something a little more automated to start with and then see if um, they take care of the issue at that point. So from the handbook, in cases where the ISP knows the mobile phone number of the customer, another option would be to push text message notifications to the user. Um, this requires knowing the specific mobile contact number and that it is a mobile number. Um, this also, uh, you know, in, in a lot of countries around the world, SMS is uh, unused or not trusted by the, the consumer. So you have to take it, that into account as well. Um, in some cases, um, this medium has moved on to applications, and so push notifications are used uh, if the customer selects to install the ISP's uh, specific communication or customer support application. Uh, so paper mail. So an ISP may consider notifying users via traditional postal mail, perhaps via an insert into their monthly bill. Uh, and again, that, that's that trust uh, uh, mechanism. They expect to get the bill from you and the, not the security notification or copyright infringement notification is there. Therefore, you've slightly authenticated that notification through uh, physical means. Uh, however, if the ISP is not already mailing the customer, uh, doing ad hoc mail notifications may be expensive and of limited effectiveness, especially if the user is predisposed to discard mail communications unopened due to a perception that they are just likely marketing. So what this uh, relates to is the fact that a lot of companies have moved on to paperless billing. Um, so you would be sending out a paper mail notification from your company when they're not used to sending it. So uh, in the United States for copyright infringements, uh, for example, um, we, uh, an ISP is required to send a notification um, via US mail that uh, the copyright notification uh, incident occurred. Um, if that customer uh, doesn't get paper billing, they may just throw that away and not even open the envelope because they assume, oh, my co cable company or my ISP is sending me um, you know, uh, an advertisement or, or a new, uh, new billing plan of some sort. Um, so you have to keep that in mind uh, when developing your policy um, and your policy when it comes to repeats, notifications, um, and how you do your outreach. 
So in situations where the user has purchased an on-site support contract, uh, another notification approach may be via an in-person truck roll to the customer's site. Uh, obviously, the ISP technician will need to be able to satisfy the customer of his or her credentials uh, and authenticate that they are indeed an employee of the ISP. Uh, we also note that this can be very expensive notification option. So this would not be, this would probably be a last resort for many companies. Um, something like, you know, you need to address a malware infected gateway in the home or some other sort of device that you provided the customer. This would not be a, an effective tool to notify customers that they have a virus infection on a PC, for example. Uh, much less, you know, the customer would probably not want to see a stranger telling them that they have a virus on their computer uh, unexpectedly like that. So browser notification, uh, in this approach, an ISP notifies the user by interposing an interstitial message when the user attempts to visit a normal website. Uh, this approach can be somewhat disconcerting for some users, uh, but is less disruptive than some other approaches such as the, the next walled garden approach that we'll talk about in a second. Um, so browser notifications, there's documentation. MOG has best practices on how to apply uh, browser notifications. Um, the IETF has documentation on uh, the means to do that. Um, but with a lot of the transition to um, uh, TLS encrypted uh, HTTP traffic uh, and a lot of devices using HTTP for things like uh, video streaming, um, this can be somewhat disruptive, like they mentioned. Um, and a, a customer may not see the notification uh, right away. Instead, they may suffer some sort of technical issue that they then end up calling into customer support anyhow uh, to resolve. So uh, again, you have to consider when is this appropriate and you know what, what type of customers are, are uh, um, being affected by it. So if an ISP needs to immediately limit the damage uh, that an infected user can cause, uh, one option is to put them in a, to a so-called walled garden. Uh, this is if you can uh, affect the ga gateway in their home, essentially, or, or the, the modem that was provided to them. Uh, so when this is done, the user is allowed to access selected sites for remediation and hardening purposes, and may perhaps be allowed to continue to have a voice over IP service uh, for things like access to emergency services, so E911 in the United States and, and similar services uh, in other regions. Typically, though, uh, the customer cannot access most other internet resources. Should be emphasized that this strategy is not meant to be punitive. Walled gardens have been extremely effective in diminishing the amount of infection at the consumer ISP level. Um, so if you don't have specific ports blocked coming out of the customer home, like port 25, um, but you do have the means to place the customer into a walled garden uh, where you warn them that, um, you know, you're temporarily cutting off their traffic until they, you know, click a, um, you know, confirmation that they've fixed the problem. Uh, this can be very effective. Again, you need to evaluate what policies uh, you would use this for and, um, you know, uh, how often you would apply it. And is your customer service ready to take the uh, troubleshooting calls when, um, when they're prompted with the walled garden. So with that, uh, before we get into automation, uh, I wanna give everybody a chance to take a five minute break. I know we're all kind of remote um, and you know you may have some obligations you have to uh, check in with, email, family, et cetera. Um, also though, if you have any questions uh, or, or need to ask for any sort of clarity, um, you know, we'll, we'll take a break here and I will stay uh, right here. And we'll reconvene at, well, we'll say 9.50 uh, Eastern time. So um, more like a seven minute break, but thank you.
All right, we received one question so far. Uh, and the question is, how can we classify and organize incidents with scores or severity levels? On my company, we are leveling the levels from zero to five or info to critical, uh, but is there another way to do it? Um, and so, uh, right, I, and I see that's kind of based on um, the way you're doing it is based on uh, log output as well or security um, um, security uh, alarms uh, from monitoring tools. One thing to consider is if you're looking at issues um, that concern your customers, uh, then you also have to look at uh, how severe is the customer experience, um, especially if you respond to it. So um, I'll, I'll give some examples that might help um, clarify. Um, if I see one report from an individual saying, your customer sent me one piece of spam email, um, I may just send a warning email to my customer. And, and that would be categorized as a, a, a low priority incident. Whereas if I received a hundred different reports within an hour about spam emails from my customer, then that's probably uh, indicative that the customer has a much larger issue or the customer is a spammer themselves. Um, so I would prioritize that higher, even though it's both spam incidents, um, the issue is much more severe in this case. Similar, if the customer is engaged in activity that is against the law in my country, um, then that gets a higher priority level. Um, so we, we typically prioritize things based off of type of attack, uh, with the last one being uncategorized. Um, so if there's a physical element to it, uh, like, like I said, it's some sort of legal law breaking, some sort of online harassment that may lead to physical harassment, those are understood to be high priority um, because there is a, a more imminent threat to it. Uh, if the customer, um, like I said, is just sending out a, a newsletter to people who didn't want the newsletter, that is not so much of a threat. That's not contributing to malware uh, distribution, spread uh, um, of phishing emails, that sort of thing. Um, that would be lower priority and you know would be back of the line potentially. Um, so with severity levels, how you label them, you, you could call them zero to five um, or you know critical or, or you know there, there's a number of labels you could apply to that. Um, but it really kind of comes down to how many reports you've seen and what is the threat uh, of the activity that your customer was engaged with. Uh, so I hope that uh, answers your question, um, but it's a good question. Okay, we'll get started in just another minute. Okay, uh, we got one more question here. Uh, what is the best practice to follow the takedown of a malicious domain? Uh, so I assume it is you're a hosting provider and you've received an incident report about a, a domain um, being hosted uh, within your service. Uh, in that case, um, again, you know, uh, what you can do with your customer all depends on, uh, you know, uh, local regulations. Uh, so, you know, you have to take that into account. But typically, uh, once you receive the report, um, hopefully it's categorized in a way that your analysts are able to quickly identify who the customer responsible is and, you know, where their account lies. Um, and you would typically, I, I don't come from a hosting provider, so I'm going based off of what I've seen from other companies. Uh, but putting a placeholder page uh, in, in, and a lot of hosting providers have the means to do this automatically putting a placeholder page so that people going to the domain understand that it is uh, malicious, um, potentially redirect, putting a redirect in that sends uh, new 
request to um, some sort of security training or education about the attack. Um, and then following up with the customer, hopefully you have records um, that you can uh, identify who the customer uh, is that uh, the content was hosted on. You have live contact information. Um, it's not a fake account. Um, you have some way of validating that, hopefully. Um, but otherwise, if you're unable to validate that it's a real person who set up the account, um, you know, maybe it's a, a cheap service of some sort um, where they can set them up fairly easily, uh, then I would imagine you would set up um, some sort of uh, page where if they try to log back into their account for management, they are made aware that, you know, you've disabled the account based off of that. Um, this is also where incident tracking comes into play uh, because, you know, you would have a log of what IP address signed up for that account, what IP address tried to let authenticate into that account, and keeping track of that helps you to potentially prevent them from signing up other new accounts and setting up that domain again and again and again. Um, so there's a number of uh, uh, number of these tenants to kind of apply there. Um, but hopefully that uh, that answers the question. Um, as far as takedown of a malicious domain that um, it's attacking your company or it's posing as your company, but someone else is hosting it. Um, there's <clears throat> this is where I recommend uh, groups like First and like Mog, where you can start building up that that trusted circle of collaborators to where. Um, you know, if you attend MOG, for example, and, and I believe they're members of FIRST as well, companies like um, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, who has, you know, the Azure hosting, um, you can start building those relationships with their engineers and their analysts to where if there is a, um, a attack on your company being hosted on their service, you can reach out directly to them and work with them to get that taken down more quickly because they understand that um, you know, they can trust you as a source, you're giving them all the information that they need and that you're using that relationship uh, uh, responsibly. Um, so you know, organizations like this are very critical to an abuse desk organization. And uh, another question, uh, good morning to you. And uh, the question is, any tracking connection system you could talk about, NetFlow? Uh, tracking connection, tracking connection system. Um, so I don't work on the edge or, or the, the routing side of things, um, but I know, uh, you know, from what I've seen from our security organization and MOG has a denial of service uh, SIG that, that talks about um, flow spec and, and, you know, reviewing some of those logs. Um, you know, if you're able to look at that traffic and um, make use of it uh, to hopefully get in front of new attacks instead of waiting for other people to um, send it to you, um, you know, that, that can be very valuable. Um, I, I work for a major ISP here in U the United States, um, and I've worked for abuse desk and legal compliance for about 20 years. And I work quite a bit with our security operations center who sends us, you know, um, the, the sorts of uh, bad traffic that they see if there's a large denial of service that they've detected coming out. They're not actively monitoring for things like spam or phishing, of course, because that would require a packet, um, you know, resolution. And, and, you know, we don't want to look at that sort of traffic. But if they see, you know, a traffic rate and destination ports and destination uh, uh, ASNs um, that look abnormal to them, they will package up that information. And we have an API that they can feed that info into and produce new incidents that will follow up with the customers, um, potentially put them in a walled garden state if they're you know, participating in a denial of service attack, uh, which we, we prioritize fairly high. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, network tracking systems you know, internally can be very useful. Other companies sending you their data from their systems can be very useful. Um, and it's, it's a good systemic sort of incident log um, that you can build automation towards again, which is a good segue into our next uh, section here. Uh, as far as which system in particular I, I could um, recommend, I unfortunately, like I said, I, I'm I don't work directly on a, you know the routing and the the security operation side of things. So.
So one more comment in our experience after reporting to registrars uh, abuses, the domain is still online, even with domain status uh, equaling or the domain status flag being client transfer prohibited. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think what you're starting to see now is, um, you know, with the amount of, um, you know, extremely bad you know, content or harmful content, misinformation, political misinformation, um, uh, video content being hosted on some of these domains. Um, some of the registrars are starting to become, um, you know, some of the ones that weren't as responsive in the past are becoming more responsive. Um, but what I am seeing them uh, do at least is send their analysts and their engineers to, you know, some of these organizations like, like MOG and First again. Um, to start participating and, and learn more about best practices because they understand that, you know, they, they may have a, a bad reputation in the community and in the industry. And, you know, uh, it, it, even since I, I drafted some of this training a couple of years ago, I, I am seeing, um, you know, this uh, dedication to being good network services, being responsive network services, uh, whether it's a social media platform or an ISP or a hosting platform. Um, you know, executives and people making the decisions as to how to fund security within their organization um, has been improving. Um, so hopefully that, that that continues and, you know, uh, we can have this open dialogue about what people are doing wrong or what they can improve on. Um, and, and they, you know, get a seat at the table and uh, start improving on that. All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and, you know, as I said before, uh, you know, feel free to ask Q&A and, you know, I'll, I'll take a break here and there um, to answer the questions. Um, some things I uh, may wait uh, till the end, um, you know, to, to kind of follow up on, um, but hopefully I can get to all of them uh, within our time frame here. Uh, but let's talk about uh, the automation of a, uh, incident processing. So, you know, you may get to a point where, you um, you know, you're getting so many incidents in to your abuse ad account or, or whatever reporting uh, website you, you've set up, um, you know, that, that the people that you hired, they don't have um, the ability to go through each, every incident one by one by one. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what a automation uh, workflow looks like uh, for an abuse desk. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So starting with a report up in the upper left, uh, this is a high level overview of the email abuse incident intake process. Uh, this highlights some key areas where technical solutions can be implemented. So all stages uh, should produce event logging, uh, preferably in a centralized location. Uh, this will aid in efficient process improvement analysis or outage troubleshooting. I don't know how many of you are developers, um, but you know, e even with uh, so much computer science history behind us, um, there's still an issue with people building systems that don't log as much as they should and don't create as much uh, tracking as they should in order for you to go back and see where inefficiencies are or where you can make improvements or you know where, where the breakdowns occur. So, um, you know, I, log collection and data tracking is always something that, you know, I stress from the onset uh, you know, should be put into place. So let's, uh, let's go through the process uh, for a report that comes in via email uh, to a role account such as abuse ad or postmaster ad. So, um, According to the RFC, if you have a domain, uh, you should accept email at abuse at that domain or postmaster at that domain. And typically that's where a lot of automated reporting systems uh, will send uh, reports about your customers to. So given that the role accounts uh, will most often route to the same inbound mail server as uh, the general MX record, uh, those uh, mail transport server servers, those SMTP servers, will need to be configured for exceptions to normal processing. Uh, abuse desk incidents will often contain material from phishing and spam attacks, uh, including the malicious URLs. Uh, so the mail system administrators will need to ensure that these are not blocked or filtered and that the reporting server isn't necessarily affected by sending these reports to the server. 
On the other hand, the ability to prevent mail bomb attacks against the Roll account and prohibit known sources of spam from sending to the domain has to be considered as well. So adjusting these uh, mail policies will take several iterations uh, as each organization's traffic is different. Um, so essentially, you know, if people are reporting examples of spam, full examples of spam or phishing email that your customers are sending to them, you want to make sure that your mail server is not treating those as phishing or spam, that they're getting them into your system uh, properly um, and not filtering them out. Uh, but by the same token, you you do need it, it can't be wide open because you may have a mailbox bomb attack or denial of service attack uh, directed at your uh, role account there. So a typical inbound message uh, will be transported from the SMTP server to a mail store system of some kind to await retrieval. Um, many modern SMTP servers also provide functions to send messages over HTTPS uh, to a remote API based on specific conditions. Uh, so the message store is typically where your mail clients would pop or IMAP um, retrieve the email. Um, but if the system has the ability to send stream the messages over HTTPS or you know send them uh, through to an a API of some sort, uh, that saves you the need to store the messages. Um, so it saves you on some disk space, um, and it subsequently ingests them over more time. So it saves you some disk space, um, but also POP3 and IMAP as retrieval protocols can take a lot of time. So if you're processing, um, you know thousands and thousands of messages a day uh, for our incident reports and intel uh, information, um, POP3 or IMAP may not keep up with that flow uh, into your, uh, through the rest of your tool set. Uh, so you may wanna have the mail administrator configure a report to go directly to the incident processing engine uh, where it's destined for a specific role account. So in a typical manual abuse desk operation, uh, the ingestion point is when stored inbound reports are retrieved and viewed with a mail client. Uh, so some abuse desks, um, you know, and this is how I started early on in my career. Um, it was just Outlook looking at the one email account and, and I was processing them all, um, you know, manually. Um, but as automation is introduced, applications can retrieve these emails over the same protocol and be further processed for data enrichment or the rest of the incident phase. Uh, depending on the number of reports per day, uh, use of these protocols may be inefficient, like I mentioned earlier, uh, or altogether infeasible given transactional overhead. Uh, a more advanced solution, as mentioned previously, would be to provide the MTA with an endpoint to inject the message into subsequent processing in real time. So, from there, uh, categorization logic supplied. Uh, this would be the priority model that we discussed earlier. Uh, it typically consists of predefined pattern matching and conditional evaluations, like the example I listed there. Uh, categorization will evolve over time as new sources of incidents appear, uh, new services are, are launched, or attack vectors evolve. Uh, the solution processing the logic should allow for new conditions to be added. So if all of a sudden your low priority spam numbers start spiking, you start seeing a lot of incidents being categorized that way um, versus some of your other categories, that's where you want to review your incident tracking and, and your processing logs to see if there's someone new sending you these reports and are they actually spam or are they firewall reports that you're not categorizing correctly. From there, uh, identifying the subscriber device responsible for an incident will depend heavily on the service provider and is where much of customization takes place for large scale solutions. Uh, for an ISP, this will typically involve queries against their own LDAP and DHCP services uh, to associate a customer with an email address and IP lease. For other service platforms, the lookup may be relative to the domain being sent from or the assigned IP that their traffic is transmitted from. Typically, an organization will have a secured API or data store available uh, for this information as it's utilized for support tools and accounting as well uh, for your billing services and whatnot. Uh, given the critical nature of subscriber data, placement of the abuse desk automation platform on your network may have to take into consideration uh, your security policies surrounding access to this data. Um, so this is where having 
um, you know, if you build a complete automation solution or, or you buy a complete automation solution, um, you may be required to put it, you know, deep within the firewall infrastructure of your organization because you're going to be transporting subscriber PII, um, account numbers, phone numbers, contact information. Um, so you have to take that into account. Um, you're going from a public report intake to um, you know internal subscriber identification. So at some point you'll be hopping from the public to the private network. So remediation logic will also depend on corporate customer engagement and regulatory policies, uh, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, the solution should recognize per category and other defined conditions where to route the incident for resolution. As we discussed earlier, uh, associating the offending party with an email address in order to send a warning notification may suffice. In other situations, a highly prioritized manual investigation and interaction via phone call may be necessary. Uh, when manual remediation is required, the abuse desk team members should have consistent and easy to find reference materials that they are able to contribute to as new problem cases or tools arise. Uh, maintaining a knowledge database is essential to providing the customer with a positive experience while correcting the current incident and hopefully preventing reoccurrence. So uh, automating other sources, um, you know, the, the automation phase concept in processing email reports uh, can remain fairly consistent for other types of reports uh, that you may be open to receive. Uh, things like web forms are often used in order to facilitate the gathering of all the required information uh, for an incident. Uh, while useful in minimizing reports that cannot be processed because you're asking for the specific data that you need, it does make it difficult for an automated reporting uh, system from a third party to interact with. Um, so I would not recommend that as your one and only intake source for an abuse desk but it is helpful for specific types of incidents. Another potential intake option for platforms or providers that support services beyond email is XRF, uh, which is, um, uh, there's an IETF RFC listed here that um, you can read up on. Uh, the concept provides a means of efficiently processing reports for a variety of network act attacks and policy violations which historically had undefined report structures that made automation difficult. So report generation, parsing, and validation all, all have open source libraries to build solutions with. Uh, so if you go to xarf.org, uh, you can find you know, a lot of the information uh, as well as reference links for the various open source libraries um, to implement this. So the scope of your automation can include benefits to other groups within your company. So we talked about the net flow incidents um, coming into your abuse desk as well, or other connection tracking. Um, so the same system and logic that you took in XR for email or web uh, incidents could potentially provide uh, the abuse desk with a solution to handle data from internal sources based off of analytics. If the abuse desk or other security department within the organization has frequent analytics cycles in order to detect likely account compromise or violations of the acceptable use policy, these two could be fed into the collection and remediation system. So um, things like the connection tracking system, uh, your, the team that um, administers your authentication system, um, maybe set up some policies with them to say, you know, if we see several um, uh, account logins from all over the world to one single account, that account may be compromised. Um, have them send you the timestamp, the user information and the IPs involved, um, you know, or whatever your, your system requires to identify a customer. Um, you know, most systems that are public facing services within your company can be sources of analytics and logs that your abuse desk can uh, act on uh, when it involves the customer. Um, this is especially true nowadays because, um, you know, one of the biggest issues facing abuse desks and, and um, incident response teams is account compromise. Um, the, you know, the rise in, you know, trying to gather credentials from customers and, you know, using those shared credentials to access 
you know, things as innocent as Netflix or, uh, um, you know, Amazon uh, video uh, to getting into bank accounts, to opening credit cards and, and performing identity theft. Um, so getting a handle on account compromise by working with your authentication team to, you know, intake, uh, you know, what looks like abnormal behavior um, and setting up conditions about that can be a big win for the abuse desk, um, you know, as far as being the team that, you know, produces those, uh, those securities for an organization. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about the actual staff, the actual people doing the work now. So, um, a successful abuse desk analyst uh, or technician uh, depends on what your company you know calls them engineer uh, requires a diversified set of skills. Uh, one must be technical, but also able to effectively communicate with customers and outside uh, vendors. Um, you know a, they may be dealing with a, a number of uh, different types of uh, parties, uh, and so you want to also make sure that uh, empathy and verbal communication skills is present. So when you estimate the size of the team or you're looking to expand uh, an existing team, uh, long-term trends have to be taken into account. Um, so this is, again, when you're looking at incidents over time, you know, if you start trending and, and you see there's a, um, you know, a, a potential bump in growth, maybe you're taking on a new account compromise program to support, or maybe you're just seeing incidents build as your company brings on new customers. Um, you know, being able to quantify that, you know, helps you plan out how big your team needs to be. Uh, so while it's not feasible to be consistently overstaffed uh, compared to the average incident rate, uh, your department should be able to stop large influxes as quickly as possible. Uh, growing problems that are not dealt with quickly become a backlog that is much more expensive to recover from uh, if a, a large attack happens and you're short staffed. There's some core duties throughout most abuse desks that require technical skills. Uh, your operation may vary in how many of them are necessary and what can be trained on the job due to the proprietary nature of your service platforms. So you may have internal tools, internal billing accounts, databases, um, you know, all of that has to be taken into account whether or not, um, you know, you require someone to have, you know, network service testing skills, let's say, or someone to be um, uh, uh, familiar with uh, uh, Apache log, um, you know, uh, parsing and, and that sort of thing. So once a team is built, it's important to ensure measures are taken to keep those employees engaged and as stress-free as possible. Uh, abuse desk fatigue has become fairly well documented in a number of recent articles. Um, you know, a, a, whether they're called a compliance desk, abuse desk, or, um, social media platforms call them moderation desks a lot of times. Um, there's quite a few news reports uh, showing how um, the job takes a mental stress on employees. Uh, so keeping the employees up to date with information and pending changes, uh, maintaining clear and honest communication with the employee, uh, giving importance to their ideas and opinions, uh, as well as providing them honest feedback and generous praise, uh, seem to have the most support when we talk to uh, um, managers and, and executives of uh, um, productive and successful abuse desk teams. Uh, abuse work is generally a thankless task. Um, you know, customers don't typically call in and say, you know, thank you for warning me about a security incident. Um, so, you know, your employees feeling that upper management's being supportive and recognizes the importance of their work is a great boost to the employees. So make sure that they're getting positive feedback, um, you know, from, from some direction there. So while it may incur some costs initially, uh, ensuring that your team is able to perform their functions and make decisions based on experience and internal reference materials uh, will ensure long-term protections for the company's reputation or brand, uh, as well as maintain employee satisfaction with the function that they're performing. Uh, involving employees in abuse-related decision-making, asking them for their ideas, opinions, and possible solutions, uh, and then making it clear that those thoughts were taken into ser serious consideration 
Um, it's, uh, it's empowering technicians to make decisions uh, regarding the work they're doing uh, and having management back them up when those decisions are uh, made with, you know, even irate customers uh, receiving equal share of the votes. So, you know, involve them in the decision making, um, you know, a, as more incidents are worked over time by the technicians or the analysts, um, they will have a better sense for what policies are effective and what are not effective. If they're seeing the same customer uh, every day or every week uh, having the same issue, then, you know, there may be something that needs to change on the service or there may be something um, about your policies and the priority model that needs to change. So, you know, involving them in the, the review of the work and the decision making, um, you know, is critical, but it also helps with their morale. So as described in a white paper regarding the processing of sensitive incident reports, uh, a MOG member and I believe a first member, uh, Alexander Hugula uh, explains that, uh, quote, exposure to such content requires a suitable working space setup, appropriate working conditions, and psychological assessments to protect professionals and help them safeguard their personal well-being. Um, so the first consideration is the workplace environment. Um, you know, they, they may be working on sensitive uh, information. Uh, if they're looking at things like spam emails, it may be offensive to other employees uh, who may walk by. Um, there's also a lot of customer information and security information um, that you want to make sure is uh, secured. Um, but by the same token, you don't want every uh, staff member kind of working in a bubble and feeling like they're working on this stuff alone. So things like screen protection, um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, maybe higher cubicle walls or, you know, now that they're working from home, you know, some sort of a desk, uh, um, you know, uh, walls, um, things that, you know, kind of protect the line of sight uh, may be uh, um, necessary. It's going to be different for every office space, of course. Uh, can... Continuing with his recommendations, uh, we consider the working conditions of the assigned staff members who work these uh, incidents. Um, you know, a lot of times you want to make sure that they can decide when breaks are necessary. Um, they may have had a shocking incident or, or just a really bad customer experience. Um, so, you know, they may want to take a break sooner than, um, you know, what you would have assigned them so that they can uh, decompress and, and recover from that. Um, a lot of offices use relaxation areas away from where um, they work their incidents um, and may include things like a TV or, you know, ping pong or some sort of game uh, set up. Um, but you want to have that separated from the work area, typically. Uh, you also want to have management or HR human resources staff readily available for conversations when needed. Um, if they... Um, you know, have a some sort of a, a anxiety attack because of an incident, and I have seen this happen um, because of something they saw, some interaction with a customer, um, the the criticality of the work uh, that was coming through, or it could even be the work that they're doing combined with something going on in their personal life. You want to have someone you know that can talk to them quickly about that and either address it, let them go home if need be. Um, you know, or, or otherwise just give them an ear to, you know, speak to. Um, you don't want them waiting till the end of the day or the next morning to have to deal with that. Um, and then regular team meetings to discuss working conditions. So, you know, assuming you've implemented some of this, how are they using it? Is it comfortable for them? Are, are they finding it useful? Um, you know, is there anything else, you know, that, that they would rather have in, in some of these situations? So, you know, with a lot of the uh, content that they'll have to be examining and, and the, the type of work that they'll be doing, uh, you want to consider psychological help. Um, Mr. Huglo describes the need for this consideration uh, before, during, and after even the job is assigned. Uh, he advises not to generalize a type of person who will be able to endure this job, but rather allowing for a professional to consider their ability and ongoing help. Um, so while it, it seems like, uh, you know, this would be high cost, um, you know, it, it offering some sort of psychological evaluation or, you know, some, some form of this, depending on what's available in your region, um, 
can cost you less in the long run than having to consistently um, uh, replace employees and, and train new ones into the job. Um, in some cases, it may be, you know, uh, it, it could turn bad for your company if you have a lot of employees suffering mental health issues as a result of the job. Um, you know, we've seen where they go to the press and the media and, and talk about how they feel unsupported and how they, they turn to things like drug abuse or, or you know, depression um, as a result of the job. And, you know, your company does not, you know, your company can avoid that. That's not something that's a positive effect on the brand. And so, um, you know, for their health, you know, consider again before, during and after the, the job assignment. So uh, let's take a look at results and reporting for the abuse test training. You have your people in place, you have your, your tools in place. Um, how do you share your success, right? How do you show that, you know, you've taken all of this into consideration and you've built up a team, um, you know, that, that you know, uh, is efficient and uh, um, high morale. Uh, so due to the level of effort required in maintaining a successful abuse test, um, you know, we often fail to document and share our success with the rest of our company. Um, you may feel if you're the manager or, or, you know, you run the abuse desk that, um, you know, no news is good news, as some of us like to say that, you know, if you're not uh, being listed on spam house or, you know, there's not a lot of customer complaints uh, coming into the customer service center, um, that it's you're doing your job and, you know, you'll continue doing your job um, because no one's reporting that you're doing a bad job. But, you know, what we forget a lot of times is reporting out and making sure um, the rest of the company and even the industry know that you're doing a good job and, and how, you know, much uh, work you have to do to maintain that lack of complaint. So uh, one example, um, you know, if you want to tie dollars to it uh, is cost analysis. You know, there's a number of things that, you know, you may touch as a result of processing incident. Um, so this chart details the data points uh, for defining a cost of spam to stakeholders within your company. Uh, the chart details um, what's required to determine both the number and the cost of staff required to handle the number of incoming incidents. So, you know, things of how much does one piece of spam cost your company, you can tie some numbers around and then, you know, for the amount of spam you block or the amount of um, spam you filter, um, you can reflect that as a potential cost savings for your company. Um, and, and this is an example, same with, you know, malicious domains. Um, you know, if you, you calculate the cost of your staff and how many incidents, how many less incidents you took in because you're effectively taking action on those malicious domains, Again, that's cost savings that, you know, potentially you get to use to uh, enhance your department or at least is a success, um, you know, in, in your executive size. So uh, to summarize, uh, a successful abuse test cannot rely solely on the expectations of the industry in many cases. Um, so the benefits should be quantifiable per type of activity. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it helps justify ongoing performance, but it also potentially enables you to involve into other similar roles, right? So you know, if you barely have enough staff and resources to respond to phishing incidents, you're not going to want to take on things like uh, compromised account response necessarily and help build a new, more efficient system for that. But if you show how much your phishing incident response has saved in customer service cost or email storage costs, then that could be the justification to bring on more people and, and start an account compromise project, things like that. And so, you know, many of us come from a technical background, from an engineering background. So we, we don't typically think along the lines of business and financial justification, but, it, you know, it, there are things that, you know, have costs associated with them that your finance team or your accountants may not be looking at, but, you know, you're aware of it and you, you know, taking some time to tie those dollar amounts together, that, you know, the, the cost together, you know, could definitely help your department in the long run. Um, my abuse desk team uh, at the ISP that I work at, 
like I said earlier, 20 years ago, it was me working out of uh, Outlook, responding to spam and firewall complaints and the occasional, you know, harassment complaint um, on AOL chat or whatever, you know, was being used at that time. Um, you know, we've built that up over time and, you know, because of things like copyright infringement having to be done and, and some of the successes we had in automating uh, the email report intake and, and, you know, making efficient use of uh, the resources we had together uh, available. Uh, we train technicians to become developers and help us do that automation as well over time. Um, so you had people who knew both the technical and the customer um, pieces of it. Uh, at, at this point, we have over uh, 75 technicians uh, reviewing thousands and thousands of incidents and, and building data models for account compromise, um, you know, creating reputation scores and trying to prevent um, a, a attacks and be responsive to denial of service attacks. So, um, you know, again, the abuse and security departments, a lot of times are the underfunded departments, right? Um, they, they don't get as much attention as new products or uh, customer service perhaps, but you know, if you are um, you know, creative with how you, you know, show your success and show what you can offer the company, uh, you, you can definitely start building on and getting more of that support uh, for what you need to do. So with that, um, again, Thank you, um, and I appreciate first, uh, you know, letting me uh, have this uh, workshop time and uh, talk with some of you, um, but I will open it up to questions now, um, but otherwise, thank you for joining. Also, I forgot to put the contact information on the sheet here, but if you do have any other questions or you want to follow up about anything else, I will throw my email address into the chat window. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, Mog, I'll take this opportunity to also mention, um, so I was asked for my LinkedIn account as well. Uh, I will try to grab that momentarily. Uh, so Mog, I'll also take this opportunity uh, to say, you know, Mog.org, um, you know, take a look at that. Uh, we are, you know, we partner with FIRST, um, you know, and, and have done similar, um, you know, presentations in the past. We work with LACNIC um, and we have formed a LACOG as a result of that, um, JP, Japanese OG. Uh, Afra Og, uh, a, a coordination of uh, six African nonprofits, uh, has been formed uh, to have their own working group, um, and so it is a unique space to work on security incidents and, and collaborate with the the other industry. And so, you know, I invite you to kind of get involved there as well. Uh, but again, you know, follow up with me if you have any questions. Uh, for the person asking for my LinkedIn account, I, I can't grab the link right now, but if you send me an email reminder, I will send that over to you. All right. Thanks again, everybody, uh, and enjoy the rest of your day.